Hi, I'm Stu Harrison, and welcome to another version of the Think Tank. I'm pleased to welcome Julie Davis, who's the VP External Relations and Advancement at Trent University. And we're here to talk about uh, the Trent Lands Plan and uh, lots of uh, lots lots to unpack with that. But uh, first of all, Julie, uh, welcome to the to the Think Tank. Good morning, Stu. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't know too many conversations uh, that don't start with a conversation about the pandemic. So I think we should probably start there. And I think it's a way for us to get into the, the lands and nature areas plan. So um, my sense is, uh, you know, knowing what has happened to post-secondary education and all of the restrictions and everything over the last year, that uh, this hasn't been a fun time uh, mm -hmm. to be in, in university. So can you give us a bit of an overview of uh, the impact of the pandemic on Trent and, and the student body? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's been, uh, you know, transformational in so many ways, um, you know, positive and negative. Um, you know, the, the dramatic shift to online learning uh, certainly took its toll on faculty and students. And so you can imagine if you've been uh, teaching a class in person for five, 10, 15, 20 years to suddenly, uh, you know, lose all of that face-to-face -face contact, all of the uh, engagement, uh, you know, it has required quite a lot of, of faculty to find ways to deliver their content in an engaging way. Um, for students, you know, remembering that these are 18, 19, 20 year olds uh, who are just entering for most people, one of the most exciting phases of your life. Um, it's It's been, um, hard, but we've been so impressed um, with the resiliency of, of the students um, and the support of everybody at the campus. It's really brought out the best um, in, in folks as they've tried to, to navigate, support each other, um, incredible efforts to find ways to uh, help the community at the same time. And so often a, a really good way of coping is to, you know, share what you can with other people and, and try to, you know, yeah, you know, reduce, reduce the burden on others. And so we've seen a lot of giving as well. Um, you know, it's, it's a quiet campus. I would say, you know, I, I, from late summer, I started to go in a couple of days a week because we did have uh, students on campus, students in residence. And so it was important to, for, for some of the senior team to be there on a regular basis. Uh, the geese have taken over <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a, for a place that is supposed to be vibrant and lively and just see, you know, so many people to have no, no, no limitations to parking. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's haunting in a way to arrive and pull up and, and just be so desolate. Um, certainly, you know, we had about a thousand students in, in residence and, and, you know, people ask why did we have accept students in residence? And so there's a couple of reasons. Um, not every student has a suitable place to study. And so it could be that mom and dad and younger sisters and brothers were all um, working at home and studying at home. And so you know, the need to focus and have a space um, where you could study uh, was really important for some students. Uh, access to internet, and you don't need to be rural and remote to have challenges with Wi-Fi, and you cannot participate in online learning uh, without uh, Wi-Fi and, and so there were a number of reasons um, why it was important for, for students and you know sometimes they just have to be somewhere that's safe and, and has the right environment for them to succeed hmm. um, but you know the, there was um, you know the athletic center couldn't always be opened because of the restrictions we couldn't open that to the public um, and so that again was something that for many people recreation is a, an important uh, way of managing stress and so I know that was hard of course, we didn't have a lot of international students, so um, many of them couldn't, um, you know, get the visas that they needed in their home country, even when the federal government did, you know, allow and make provisions. And so uh, that's been hard for them and, and, you know, studying for them um, with different time zones and remotely uh, mm. was, was an added burden. Mm. And I think on, on the, the, the good points, you know, the enrollment has been very stable. Um, the spring and summer enrollment last year and coming up this year has uh, almost doubled. It's, and so it makes sense that, you know, students, if they've lost their jobs, as many of them have lost their summer jobs, that they would take a couple of extra courses um, and try to, to move their program ahead in the summer. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, as an institution, um, managed well. We've been able to constrain our spending 
Um, we've had uh, some government support and so we, um, we have a balanced budget this year and we're uh, projecting a balanced budget next year. And that's very important for our stability and it's very important for the community to know that we're doing well. Well, and everything you've said uh, sheds a light on the importance of Trent to, to Peterborough mm -hmm. and, and the area has, has, you know, has an economic impact on, 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 on a number of levels and not just economic, I mean, uh, impact on a number of levels. Can you, can you share a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I reflect that, you know, one of the reasons I took this job at Trent, and I've been there 10 years now, um, was to amplify Trent's impact to the community. And so I've been in this, um, this area for 20 years. And uh, certainly when I was working at the Hospital Foundation, really got a good sense of, you know, this local community, how um, wonderful it is, and, and the role that public institutions play in making sure that it's vibrant and successful. And so I just saw that there is a great opportunity for Trent to, to do more. Um, and certainly, you know, our success as an institution is the community's success. And, and I hear so many people say, you couldn't imagine the community without Trent and without Fleming. Um, and so we're, you know, we're a top five employer. We could be number four, number three. Um, not sure where we're at right now. Uh, we did an updated economic impact uh, just last year. And so we represent about 10% of the economic value of this region, which is really significant. Yeah. And then the student spending is on top of that. So, um, you know, we bring about 85% of our students from outside of the region to this community. And so all of their spending comes with them. Um, we generate about 6,000 jobs directly and indirectly. And of course, many of our alumni uh, go on to fulfill very important roles in the community. So, you know, the mayor and many uh, people in council, chief of Curve Lake, the MPP, the MP, they are all Trent alum and not all of them, you know, born and raised in, in Peterborough. Um, and of course, as you know, we have, uh, you know, very important recreational social infrastructure for the community. So whether it's the nature trails, the athletic center, um, large meeting and event spaces, conference accommodations. Um, and then on top of that is the, the research um, and the teaching and the learning and the knowledge mobilization that comes from that. And so, you know, it, it's... Um, it's often hard for me to get a grasp of all of that that is going on. And, and what's wonderful is many of the faculty who come to Trent uh, have a real strong desire and intent to um, align their research with the local regional needs. And so they do their work in the community and they're, um, they're volunteering on boards. They're, they're making opportunities for students to do their learning with community organizations. And, and so that um, that asset, I think, is, is really quite immeasurable, the impact that we have in, in helping uh, so many parts of the, the sector, uh, of sectors of this community learn and grow and increase their success. It's amazing. Well, if your goal was to amplify, um, you just turned up the volume. That was very <laughs> well, very well put together. Um, and it is a natural segue into the lands and nature areas plan. Um, I'm aware that this has been, you know, a long time in uh, in the making. So, if you can just give us a bit of an overview of it and and what the what what it's intended to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So, it's it's a, you can think of it as a framework for the Simons campus. So, it is focused just on the Simons campus. It doesn't deal with with Trail, which is our downtown campus. It's intended to look well into the future. So, universities are intended to be around for not just decades, but hundreds of years. And so the board has a responsibility to look ahead and see how will we ensure that we are still a vibrant university and that we're contributing uh, to the future communities and the future students. And so the role of the plan is to provide very clear guidance um, well into the future for how the campus um, will evolve and that infrastructure. Um, but it, you know, firstly, looking at us as a learning institution. So how does that campus enable us to deliver that mission and mandate um, as a steward of the natural environment? And so uh, we know very much that people, uh, many people come to Trent because of the beautiful natural environment that we have. And in fact, you know, I think 40% of our lands um, are, sorry, our natural spaces are 40% of Peterborough's natural spaces. So we're a very significant part of the natural spaces. So how do we um, fulfill our role as a steward of that? And how do we advance our role as a community anchor? And so how do we you know, continue to amplify that role? And so the plan is intended to set out that 
course and provide that, um, that high level guidance so that however um, the infrastructure develops or the natural areas are, are managed, we've got that uh, cohesive vision and that we're thinking about you know, the connections, right? The mobility around so that there's a, a plan that makes sense. Um, and so that we know when we're making decisions uh, that we've got that whole um, vision intact. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the, that's the, the broad intent of it. You know, there'll be certainly many you know, detailed studies as we move along, but it sets out our ambitions. It, it positions us, I think, very importantly right now uh, to attract the infrastructure spending that, that we're starting to see um, as part of the recovery. So having done all of that planning, all of that consultation, we're able to just get right into a lot of the, uh, the applications and we've got many, many on the way, right. um, but it also creates the, the framework for the community to, to be involved with knowing what we're intending and trying to do. And so it helps us attract the partners to bring it to life. Nice. Um, I'm not sure everyone is aware of just how big the campus mm -hmm. is. So can you give us a sense of the, just the, uh, the, the, the number of acres and what the, mm -hmm. uh, what the lands and nature areas plan uh, is is intended to do. Yeah, it's so it is. It's a very large campus, and I, um, it's not well marked at the fringes. So I don't think anybody, you know, many people don't know exactly where we begin and end. Um, you know, interestingly, we do form the border with Dura Dummer and Township of Selwyn. So we are at the very north end of the city and create those borders. And if you're coming up uh, University Road, then you know, our nature areas are actually the first part that you're entering. And, and it's, uh, it's hard to see that definition, um, but it's where the last home is. The rest of that is Trent nature areas. Mm -hmm. um, if you're coming up the ninth line, that's where Trent begins on the, the East Bank. And then we've got Water Street um, up past Woodland Drive. And so there's more than 1400 acres in total. So it's a, it's a very large campus. It's certainly right. one of the, the larger campuses in, in Canada and the scope of the natural environment there. Um, the board is committed to maintaining 60% of, of those lands as, as natural environment. And uh, that in and of itself is about 800 acres, um, which again is, you know, uh, to our knowledge, um, with Simon Fraser University, probably the most significant uh, natural environment on any campus. Hmm. So you've you've touched on the um, protection of the natural environment, but um, I'm just thinking we can just sort of systematically go through some of the highlights mm -hmm. of the plan, and you can just kind of lift that off the page for us. So uh, anything else on protection of the natural environment as far as what the plan is intended to do? Yeah, it, it was a very big part of, of the planning process. And, and maybe I'll, I'll step back and, and talk a little bit about, you know, how, how we got here. I, when I first started at Trent in the fall of um, 2011, I actually started on uh, Halloween. So I, I arrived and said, trick or treat, you'll, do <laughs> you'll figure out which. Um, it's always a fun day to, to celebrate my anniversary. Yeah, mine's um, the same. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, the um, the board had had um, directed that the um, endowment lands plan be updated. So that was the first attempt by the university in 2006 to identify where could campus and community infrastructure be built on the campus. And so one of my first tasks was to lead the community engagement around updating that plan. And so uh, that took place in 2012 and 2013. And it was through that uh, work. Uh, for instance, that the uh, development of clean tech commons was really uh, spurred on. And so that the vision of having a research and innovation park on the East Bank, we were able to articulate that and start to put in some of the plans to bring that to life. And so the intent was five years uh, later that that plan would be updated. And so in the meantime, you know, I, I got to know the campus and the community a lot better and started to get feedback about what people would like to see in future plans. I started to think a lot more about um, you know, the role of, of the planning process um, and the campus itself, um, you know, demonstrating uh, you know, how we manage our lands in accordance with what we're teaching in the classroom. And so when I started to see you know, the emergence of a, a greater focus on Indigenous um, engagement, I thought about, well, how will that take place and how will we demonstrate what we're teaching in the classroom um, in terms of how we practice. And then our focus as a, one of the leading environmental programs um, across the country, what would that look like in practice on our campus? So I actually spent a couple of years uh, just talking with different people, planners, um, 
uh, you know, members of the campus community, members of the community saying, what would an ideal planning process look like? How could we set a high standard for planning that would set a reputational piece um, for, for the institution and allow us to you know, stand behind those academic programs and say, we're doing this on our campus as well. So one of the very clear messages was the environment is so important and you need to bring that into the planning process. <clears throat> so rather than just looking at <clears throat> where you can put infrastructure, start by understanding where is nature and how do we preserve that natural environment first and let that tell you what you can do with the rest of the land. And as you do that, you need to take into account an indigenous traditional knowledge perspective of that. So the building of the plan started with both of those pieces. So <clears throat> un unlike other planning processes, we did field studies. Um, so we uh, did, uh, we engaged students, the community um, and uh, environmental services firms to do you know, three season studies on land that had previously been identified as developable to determine if it should or should not be, or what would the constraints be that would have to be considered. Um, and to map out uh, all of the nature areas that are already identified on the campus and see, you know, are they connected and, and how do we ensure that there is a, a connected natural environment and, and what's the status and health of that. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that was um, fairly groundbreaking in terms of, you know, typical planning processes. Um, and, and we learned a lot from that that changed, you know, the, through, throughout the planning where infrastructure could be located. And, and I think that's helpful and smart uh, to, to learn that early on. And we also, with the request of the Indigenous communities, also did a master archaeological plan. So again, it's better to know, um, you know, across the entire campus where there are areas of cultural significance long before you, you start to talk about, you know, what might go where. And so that was a piece that we completed as well. So that was the underpinning, really, of the plan to say, what, what is nature telling us about this campus and how do we uh, respect that first before we, we look at what infrastructure needs we have? I'm thinking of uh, the term duty to consult, which I'll mm -hmm. borrow from, you know, sort of a, become a bit of an indigenous uh, reference, but um, it's not just the in indigenous community, it's the student community, it's the community mm -hmm. itself, it's, you know, multiple stakeholders at multiple levels. And it sounds like um, there, there was a recognition that there would be some friction around, you know, what, what are the intentions of this? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it strikes me that having a plan and a well carefully thought out, researched, inclusive plan is, is, is a better way to go than just trying to, you know, shoehorn something mm -hmm. into the corner of the campus, right? Like the, yeah. you must have learned some lessons over the years mm -hmm. about even how to consult, let alone mm -hmm. who to consult with. Does that ring true? Yeah, absolutely. So from a, a campus community perspective, you know, certainly one of our challenges is um, in normal times when students are on campus, you know, it's uh, September to um, you know, end of March timeframe if you want to engage in, in person. And so that puts a, a parameter around the timing. But more importantly, students turn over. So every year you've got new students coming in who are wondering, well, what is this plan I haven't heard about? Um, and so there's a constant re-education and re-engagement uh, that we need to do to support students to understand where we're at in the process. Um, from, from an Indigenous community perspective, that has been, I'd say, one of the most rewarding aspects of, of this process. And, you know, one of the reasons why it's taken longer than I thought it, it might originally, um, and I've learned so much and, and uh, you know, it really the, the conversations at the very beginning of this process had a, had a number of very pointed um, instructions to, to me and my team. Um, number one, it's our job to learn about treaties and the history of Indigenous people. Um, and so we took that seriously and spent a lot of time building our understanding. And we created, in the end, a protocol guidebook um, for the campus as a whole. And in fact, it's been picked up by a lot of other folks as well, which just helps us to articulate and share our learning around, you know, participating authentically in land acknowledgement, smudging the significance of the land to Indigenous people, just helping everybody get to a, a bit of a common space to understand uh, the, the landscape in which we're having these conversations. Um, secondly, if you're going to engage us uh, and you're taking our um, valuable and important time, 
you know, we need to know that you this intention is authentic and, and that this is a long term collaboration and commitment to each other. And so uh, that required then to go up right up to the board to say, you know, your endorsement is important here to say that this is a long term commitment to work together. And um, to have regularity, and so we're now just at, at a monthly meeting um, basis with, with the consultation liaisons. Um, and uh, and we de developed in the plan a number of um, protocols that says here's how we will continue to collaborate and engage together. Um, and it's interesting, I was, I, there was a, a recent podcast with Simon Sinek and Brene Brown, and, and anybody who uh, knows either of them, you can imagine that the vibrancy of that. And they introduced a concept I wasn't aware of before, finite and infinite games. And it yeah. talks about, you know, you're in a competitive winner-loser perspective, or you're on the same team. And so I think one of the important um, things that we've gone through is I think is transitioning um, our institutional relationship and the way um, I think the relationship was from, you know, um, not not in a place where we were, you know, on the same page to now I think where we we can say we have a joint commitment to a healthy natural environment. Um, we have a respect for the different um, skills and, and contributions that can be made. We have embedded Indigenous traditional knowledge into our plan um, and we are excited together about the opportunities to enhance uh, indig Indigenous learning spaces and Indigenous uh, information on our campus and that we're collaborating on some of those projects. So I think for me that's one of the outcomes that I'm, I'm um, happiest about because there's a lot of positive uh, benefits to that um, for, for our region, our community, for students to, uh, to learn. So that's I, would love, uh, I would love to share that document with uh, with our community because I know that there's a lot of people in the business community who recognize that uh, diversity and inclusion is uh, incredibly important uh, mm -hmm. more than ever and uh, and will continue. Uh, to be, I, I often refer to the um, pan panels that have been installed uh, literally right across the street from our chamber mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Um, on the Millennium Trail and their interpretive panels talking about the history of the Indigenous culture in this area, uh, specific information about the treaties and some of the background on that. And I often, as part of our own land acknowledgements, talk about that and encourage people to go and visit the panels. But um, I would love to be able to <coughs> share some of your uh, learnings on that as well, because I know people are in increasingly interested. And I love the infinite game. I actually spoke to a group of young uh, future leaders from the New Canadian Centre a couple of weeks ago, and that was essentially the focus of my talk, mm -hmm. is talking about um, the infinite game and how there are um, there are a number of ways to go about things, but um, that that really rang true. So anyone watching, if you're at all interested, just Google it and uh, the internet is rich with TED Talks and interviews and the book itself and uh, uh, Simon, Simon's amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's kind of fun to, to have new constructs and for me it just I, I just started to think and frame reconciliation in, in that way and, and certainly a lot of the you know I, I've just immersed myself in, in this as part of my learning and, and process of sharing with others in this plan and, and you know the Reconciliation is, is, is you know, needs to be thought of, or what, what I've understood as a journey, and that there is no destination, right? And so, you know, we we will getting onto that path together and recognizing that there are milestones that we can celebrate and times for us to look back at where we've come from, but there is no end point. Nice. And so when we, when we get to that same point where our steps are, you know, in, in tune, we're going to you know, have a, a lot more accomplished. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about Infinite Game. Good for you. I'm glad you shared that. Um, it reminds me of another, another expression. We have to stop looking for the answers to life and learn to love the questions themselves. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, Fairly exciting announcement about the uh, long-term care uh, home. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know how that fits into uh, mm -hmm. the plan and if it's an example of 
uh, how well the plan can work or if those things were mm -hmm. sort of developed uh, in concert with each other. Can mm -hmm. you share, first of all, about what the long-term care facility is and mm -hmm. how exciting the announcement was, mm -hmm. fairly recent, um, and then just see how, uh, maybe explain how it fits into the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say one of the um, really important parts of, of what the Trent Lands Plan is intended to do is uh, create opportunities for us to advance our you know, mandate as a learning institution, but also how we meet community needs and, and how we marry those two um, with the opportunity that uh, some of our lands can help us generate uh, revenue for financial sustainability. And so, you know, universities rely upon government funding um, and tuition revenue, and there's constraints to both of those. Um, and so it's really important uh, for us to look carefully at how we can generate alternate revenue. And so many universities across uh, the continent have uh, developed their lands with a lease revenue basis. And, and many of them haven't had a community or campus focus for that development. And so it's, it's really just being you know, a Walmart or a Costco. And we were absolutely rejected that approach. We said, if we're going to develop uh, any of our lands after we've learned where that should be, and we've set out the standards um, for the development to be low impact and environmentally friendly, it has to meet a learning mission and it should meet campus and community mandates. And so looking at that, then we said, well, what are the uh, assets we have to build upon? And, and we've already talked about environment and indigenous, an area of, of really growing strength and capability is aging. And so the Trent Center for Aging and Society is an interdisciplinary research um, uh, cooperative of, of faculty and, and students and emerging um, teaching uh, in that area. And it had come up in the 2012-2013 plan, the idea of a, a long-term care home. And so as we saw the Center for Aging and Society grow and started to see that a number of those researchers were involved in international studies on promising practices in long-term care. And then alongside that, uh, Peterborough being the third oldest community and having one of the longest wait lists, 2,400 people on a wait list for long-term care, wow. it says, okay, this is all coming together. This is something that we, we could pursue. Uh, so back in uh, 2019, uh, the government announced that they would be um, funding new long-term care beds, and there hadn't been any new applications for, for bed licenses for a, a number of years. And we said, great, this is our opportunity. So we're, we're not in the business of, of building or operating long-term care, and so uh, we issued a, a request for proposals for uh, uh, um, a collaborative partner in, in, to, in doing that. And so we... Uh, we were able to, uh, to, to go through that process. The very high standard we had was you have to want to be a research center, right? That, and, and experiential learning that you're willing to take students from all across the campus, not just nursing and kinesiology and social work, which are obvious, um, but business, sustainable agriculture, whatever other opportunities there might be for students to participate in this. And so the application went in uh, March of 2020 and we actually expected to hear um, you know, fairly soon after that, because we've, we've done a lot of work to, um, you know, ha have some visibility to that proposal. And then, of course, COVID and all of that was delayed. So it was, um, we were thrilled to get the news. It was, uh, I think we got a 48 hours notice that it was, uh, it was being awarded. And uh, I think, you know, the, the most exciting part was we brought 224 new beds to Peterborough. So that's 224 families. Um, that will be able to have the right kind of care um, uh, for their loved ones. And uh, that those who are caring for them, in many cases, will be able to get back to work and, and do what they need to, to do for the, the rest of their family. Uh, but really exciting is this uh, commitment to um, developing and adopting and perpetuating into the sector promising practices for long-term care, um, as well as um, introducing students to um, gerontology and caring for the elderly. And so if we just look at nursing, for instance, nursing students um, are often much more attracted to ICUs, to ERs, to surgery, to what's seen as more exciting professions and, and maybe dismiss um, gerontology and aged care. Yet when they get involved, they number one, see all of the wonderful emotional connections that they develop when they um, are involved in caring for the elderly. But then they realize it's actually probably the most complex care 
um, because of all of the many different um, physical and emotional needs. And so we're also preparing a workforce for the future um, when we bring it to the campus. And so what we envision is a, a senior's village uh, that in and of itself we will develop with the community um, because we have a great uh, age-friendly Peterborough community and, and lots of assets to draw upon so that we as a community can say what would the ideal village look like, how would we build that community, and it will be intergenerational because it's walking distance from the campus so students can go and participate in so many ways. Um, whether that's helping build and support community gardens with the residents, they could be integrated living um, and, and the long term care home is kind of the, the core of that because that's going to attract all of the assisted living, supported living and, and other pieces. So we're, we're really thrilled. Is there a location for it? Yes, yeah, so it will be at the northwest corner of Water and Woodland. Okay. And so we're just uh, completing the uh, but the um, environmental studies, we've, uh, we've spent the year with Indigenous communities uh, doing those studies. So again, it's the first project that demonstrates the, the process that we've set out and that's, uh, that's going well. So um, yeah, just throughout the timing couldn't be better because we've, uh, we've just completed the plan and so all of the standards are set in terms of what we want that to look like. Nice. It also brings up the uh, topic of housing, which I think is mm -hmm. also an important uh, conversation, obviously. Um, in Peterborough, but student housing chews up a lot of housing. So uh, I'm assuming the plan allows for that as well. Yeah, we'd like to see what well, we are, we're um, hoping and planning to build uh, a new college and expand an existing college on our core campus. Again, the pandemic just delayed that, um, but that would add uh, another you know, six, 700 beds on the core campus. And then, yes, we've uh, anticipated student housing as well in the seniors village, and, but we don't know yet what that might look like. We'll, we'll get lots of ideas, I think, whether that's separate housing or could be integrated in you know, different floors. So I think you know, we, can, we can come up with new models to see what best suits our community. Amazing. Well, um, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, that was a lot to unpack. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, walk us through it. Um, where can people find the plan and uh, more information if they're interested? Yes, well, um, on the Trent website, um, if they look up Trent Lands Plan, there's a, there's a website there. Uh, the plan is broken down into a number of pieces, but if you read the executive summary, that gives you a good uh, overview. Um, and uh, then we'll put on some uh, you know, additional videos. I think we're working on some, uh, some additional pieces to help people navigate it. It is a, a big, <laughs> complex plan, so we'll spend a bit of time helping people get to that. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. There's, there's so much we didn't yeah, get to talk about. The other piece I'd say that's a really big focus of the plan is farming. And so we see you know, a really big opportunity um, for us to have a larger farm with a focus on regenerative agriculture. And there's already lots of really good relationships with the community emerging around that. Wow. And so we see that being, an, a, you know, that that is the next emerging area, I think, of excellence. Uh, well, and some trend. relative uh, relevant re uh, research going on as well. Mm -hmm. Trend. So yeah, there there could be some magic there. Well, that's uh, that's enough for another issue. So we'll have to do this yeah. again. <laughs> Julie Davis from Trent University, and that is the Think Tank.